In this video, we're going to take a look at the molecular structure of different compounds, how it affects polar bonds, polar molecules, and the intermolecular attractions that occur between molecules. So bond polarity is a result of two different atoms sharing a pair of electrons, but there end up being their unequal sharing between them. Since two atoms have a different desire for electrons, they have a different electronegativity, then you end up with this tug of war over these electrons, sometimes resulting in a, what we call a polar bond. And that happens when those electrons are shared unequally. So if there is one atom that has a great, much greater electronegativity than another, then it gets those electrons a lot more, resulting in a polar bond. And that is, again, because they are shared unequally between those two different atoms. So taking a look at those electronegativity values and how much an atom wants to attract an electron when they are sharing them with another atom, then we can figure out how polar a bond is between two different atoms. How unequal is that sharing between these two different atoms? So the one that has a great electronegativity pulls on the electrons more, ends up with a slightly negative charge, and the one with the lower electronegativity loses that tug of war over the electrons, resulting in a slightly positive charge. And looking at these electronegativities, how badly those atoms want to take on electrons, then we can look at what type of bonds are going to be the result of those sharing of electrons. So if there is a difference between 0 and 0.4, there's so little difference in how much they want to take on electrons, how much they're fighting over those electrons, it ends up being what we call a nonpolar bond. So that happens like in an oxygen molecule, we have two oxygens sharing two pairs of electrons, so since they both want them equal amounts, that ends up being completely shared evenly and a nonpolar bond. It also happens between carbon and hydrogen where their difference is only 0.4. So even though they do have a different ability to attract electrons, their difference isn't strong enough that it results in a polar bond. Next uh, up is a moderately covalent bond. When that is when you have a difference of 0.4 to 1 for the electronegativities. And you're going to have unequal sharing, not a really strong unequal sharing. But again, the one with the greater electronegativity is going to pull the electrons a little bit more, hold them a little bit closer than the one with the lower electronegativity, resulting in a negative and positive partial charges on those two atoms. If there's a large difference between them, that's a very polar covalent bond. And we see that with hydrogen and oxygen in a water molecule, which will then explain why water has some unique properties that you wouldn't expect. But because it has such a polar bond and because it's asymmetrical, again, it's going to cause some interesting properties. And if you have a difference between two or more, then you have an ionic bond. So when you have a metal to non-metal, they have such a large difference in their electronegativity, such a different ability to attract those electrons when they're trying to share them, that actually they're not even being shared, they're being transferred. So here we see two fluorines again, just like the oxygens, they have the same electronegativity, so they're both pulling on them the same amount. This results in a non-polar bond. But here, where fluorine now is with bromine, and their difference is 1, that's a pretty strong polar covalent bond, and we see that fluorine with a great electronegativity, that lowercase delta there, that means partial, so it's a partial negative charge, and the bromine with a partial positive charge so it has a lower ability to attract those electrons. And then, even more so, here we have fluorine with sodium, and again, their difference being 3.1, so there isn't even a tug of war going on. Fluorine pulls on them so much more than sodium, who doesn't really want them anyway. We see that electron get transferred from sodium to fluorine. And because these polar bonds, we now can classify molecules as polar and nonpolar molecules. So when you have a unequal sharing going on within the sharing of the electrons, then you get these polar bonds, and these polar bonds can result in a molecule itself being polar. So one side of a molecule will have a slightly positive charge, and one side of a molecule will have a slightly negative charge. We call that a dipole, di meaning two, it means it has a positive and a negative side. And when you place these polar molecules in between oppositely charged plates, you can actually cause them to align and orient based upon their charges. So if you have a negative plate, it's going to attract a positive side of the molecule. And if you have a positive plate, it's going to attract the negative side of the molecule. Those molecules themselves also will attract to each other because of the different charges they have. So there's two different ways in which they can do that, one of which is called van der Waals forces, which actually breaks into two separate uh, classifications, and then hydrogen bonds, like there is in water, that uh, I'm sure you've discussed in your days of bio. So van der Waals forces, again, they split into two different 
categories, one of which is a dipole interaction, which we've already discussed. Again, when you have a polar molecule, then it has a positive side and a negative side, so those opposite charges will attract to each other, and they will stick like magnets, not as good as ionic compounds, but still having a positive and negative will attract them to each other. And the other type is dispersion forces. And these are caused as the electrons that are being shared can kind of like shift towards one side or another of the orbital which they are in. It is the weakest of the attractions between molecules, uh, but it does allow molecules to come together and kind of have an attractiveness to each other. It's kind of like when you're in a canoe and like everybody in the canoe leans towards one side and you can kind of make the canoe tip. This kind of thing happens inside those orbitals where the electrons get shifted towards one side of the orbital, kind of making this fake kind of negative side with a fake kind of positive side. So those uh, electrons can then cause a positive and negative side of that molecule, allowing those molecules to attract to each other. This occurs in all situations where you have molecules coming together because all the electrons are free to move throughout those orbitals. So we do see this even with the most uh, nonpolar molecules of oxygen. This is how oxygen could eventually cool, be cooled and added and turned into a liquid and also frozen. Here we see PCl3, phosphorus trichloride, and again it is a polar molecule because we have an unequal sharing of the electrons between the, the phosphorus and the chlorine, and we have a positive side and a negative side due to the asymmetry of that molecule. And on the right we see nitrogen, again two nitrogens sharing three pairs of electrons equally, so there is dispersion forces between them, again not very strong uh, attraction, but there is still some little attraction between those nitrogen molecules pulling them together. But the strongest of the intermolecular attractions is hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding occurs when you have a hydrogen and it is bonded to a oxygen, a nitrogen, or a fluorine because those are so much more electronegative than the hydrogen, which is the weakest of the electronegativities for nonmetals, so the weakest of the sharing that's going to happen between different atoms, then you end up with a very polar bond. Because that very polar bond, it isn't quite as good as being ionic, but it's a lot better than that phosphorus and chlorine like we just saw because of how different the electronegativity is and therefore how much more the electrons are held between um, towards a fluorine versus a hydrogen or an oxygen with a hydrogen or a nitrogen with a hydrogen. And so therefore, again, we end up with a very strong attraction between those molecules because of how different their electronegativities are how close to being almost a completely positive and negative charge you end up with. Here we see ammonia, NH3, again nitrogen with hydrogen, where you have a very polar bond going on. You have an asymmetrical molecule where all those hydrogens are down on the bottom because the two unshared uh, electrons up top of the nitrogen making it a trigonal pyramidal shape and now ending with a negative side of your molecule with a nitrogen and a positive side of your molecule with a hydrogen. So intermolecular attractions, again, are going to have a large effect on certain properties, one of those properties being how uh, likely they are to be pulled apart from each other or stuck together, resulting in different melting points and boiling points. So we end up seeing things, that, again, like, that are ionic, as we've discussed, are solids at room temperatures, and they have really high melting points because of how strongly they're attracted to each other to have to get those particles freely moving, you have to pull apart all those positive and negative char charges from each other, again requiring a lot of energy, you need to get it to a really high kinetic energy or really high temperature. Where covalent molecules are their own separate entity and you don't have positives and negatives uh, like we do in ionic, you just have the partial positives and negatives attracting them together. However, there is one type of covalently bonded molecule called a uh, network solid, which re results in having to break apart all these molecular bonds over and over and over to then get it to melt. We see that like in diamonds. Diamond is carbons bonded to carbons bonded to carbons, and it's not a bunch of individual molecules, it's just one big crystalline structure built together of covalent bonds. And again, all those bonds have to be broken apart from each other to get those carbons into a freely moving state. So it does require a lot more energy than other covalently bonded compounds. And here we see each of those different situations. Here's carbon dioxide, again, a nonpolar molecule. There is going to be unequal sharing between carbons and oxygens, but because it's symmetrical in shape, 
those oxygens are pulling equally and oppositely on those carbon electrons, so therefore it's a nonpolar molecule, and there's very little attraction between those carbon dioxide molecules, resulting in the fact that it is a gas at room temperature. Because in order to be a liquid, they'd have to have some attraction toward each other. They are in a fixed amount of volume because of the attractiveness between them. But since there isn't any, or very little, there's just the dispersion forces, they are spread apart and therefore a gas. Here we see sucrose. So it's a slightly polar molecule where you have uh, those oxygen, hydrogens coming off of those rings of carbons with the oxygen and resulting in a again slightly polar molecule so we do see sugar is a solid at room temperature because it does have a very large mass 342 so it has to be moving very violently in order to get it to break apart those bonds between it but because of its mass again can't move as quickly as we see with like water here is sodium chloride again an ionic compound full positives full negatives transferring of electrons so they are very strongly bonded together. Again, that electrostatic attraction between those ions holding them together. So we see salt with a very high melting point, about 800 degrees Celsius, where you have to put a lot of energy in to rip apart those different ions from each other. But lastly, here is our diamond structure. Again, it is just tetrahedral shape of carbons bonded over and over and over and over again, sharing pairs of electrons between them, and just continuously building out this pattern of tetrahedral after tetrahedral after tetrahedral, making this network solid. Again, in order to get it to melt, I have to break apart every single one of those covalent bonds, which require quite a bit of energy to do.